read quite a few verses, about 15 verses today. That's kind of unusual for me. But, uh, but I think it, I, I want to do that for a reason, okay? And I will be honest with you, there's one verse that is probably the saddest verse in the whole Bible to me. It's the saddest verse in the whole Bible. And uh, the psalmist is writing. Now, what is he writing about? He is writing about the nation of Israel, okay? And he's talking about the nation of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness, when they were in Egypt and God brought them out of Egypt and then they were wandering in the wilderness. That's what he was talking about. Uh, anyway, he starts out, and, and if you want to know the truth about it, this is a national confession from Israel. Okay, this, this psalm was written as a national confession. We all know what it is to confess our sin, okay? I think our nation needs to confess, get on our knees right now and repent and confess and, and do some of that stuff. But there's this national confession in Psalm 106. And if you look at Psalm 105 and, and read it, basically what the psalmist is telling Israel, look, remember his mighty deeds. Remember what all God has done in getting Israel to this point. Well, then when you get to Psalm 106, guess what it, it basically says? They forgot. They forgot what he did. They forgot his deeds. And it's one of the most sad verses that I have ever seen uh, in Scripture to me. Let's read together. Uh, we'll start verse 1. Praise you, Lord. O give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all His praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. Boy, everything sounds real good so far, doesn't it? Sure it does. But look at verse 6. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedness. That's where the confession starts coming in. Number seven, our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. Now, stop thinking about that for a minute. What is he talking about? What were the wonders in Egypt? Stop thinking about what God did for Israel while he was in Egypt. You know, God had them in slavery and bondage to, to punish them, obviously, because they had been unfaithful to him. Yeah. All right, but what was he also doing with them while they were in captivity? He was growing a nation. He was growing a nation. Their population boomed. <laughs> when they left, when they left is, uh, Egypt, there was a whole lot more of them than when they first got there. There was millions when they left. Okay? Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. He, all, but he said that, that they also didn't understand the miracles that God did to get Pharaoh to let him go. What about the plagues? Were those miracles? Yes. We tend to think about miracles as something good. And when you start reading about the ten plagues that came on Egypt, those were all bad, but they were still miracles. God still did them, and it led to something good, didn't it? Sure. He said they don't remember that. They remember not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. What does he mean they provoked God at the Red Sea? You remember the story? They're in the wilderness. They get to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army's bearing down on them. And what did they do? They started cussing at Moses. And they started cussing at Aaron. And they said, why in the world did God bring us out here just to kill us by a sword? You know? I mean, they got mad at God. But what did God do? He parted the sea and they crossed on dry land. They changed their tune on the other side, didn't they? Sure they did. It says, and he rebuked the sea also. Let's see, let's go back. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. You ever stop thinking about that? He saved them for his name's sake. We're only here because of God's mercy. Okay? That he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up, so he led them through the depths and through the wilderness. 
and he saved them from the hand of him that hated him. Who was that? Pharaoh. Pharaoh hated him. And redeemed them from the hand of the enemy, and the waters covered their enemies, and there was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. But they soon forgot his words. Boy, that to me is sad. This chapter has been so good up to this point. And then we got rid of it right here and it said, but they soon forgot. They loved him when he was saving them. But when everything was all right, they forgot his words. And they waited not for his counsel. In other words, they didn't depend on God. We get in trouble when we quit depending on God, don't we? We start depending on ourselves. But lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. What's he talking about there? Have you ever stopped thinking about that? He, they tempted God in the wilderness. Okay? Uh, are they... Uh, lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. What's he talking about? So, let's get the picture. Israel has left Egypt. They've gotten to the Red Sea. It looked like they were going to die, but God delivered them. They got to the other side of the Red Sea. They got to the wilderness, okay? Now they're out here in the wilderness. What was the next thing that they started complaining about? Because in the wilderness, what do you have? What's in the wilderness? Nothing. <laughs> What are they going to eat? That's right. What are they going to eat? That's the number one thing, right? They were hungry. So what God did? Manna from heaven, right? Bread from heaven every day. Fresh. Oh, I love bread. I can't eat it. I ain't supposed to eat it. I don't eat much of it anymore. But let me tell you something. They ain't nothing better in this world than a pan of fresh homemade biscuits with a bottle of cane syrup. Now, I'm telling you. I could eat that and make a meal out of it. I forget the butter now. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. A lot of butter. Well, see, my, my papa, he used to take his syrup and pour it in the plate, and then he'd take a big old piece of butter and drop it in there and mash it up with a fork and sop it. You know? Yeah, that's the way he did it. Now, here's the way I like to do it. I like to get that biscuit when it's right out of the oven and just put so much butter on it, it's soppy, okay? And then pour me some syrup in there and go to sopping with that biscuit. That's the way I like it. But yeah, butter. You gotta have the butter. Man, I could eat that stuff. I love bread. And these people, God gave them manna from heaven. Now, you know, stop and think about that from a very physical standpoint. Do you keep them alive? And He only gave them the amount they needed daily. That's right. That you're getting ahead of me, there, Miss Judy. But oh, think I'm about sorry. it. That's all right. No, think about it. Think about it. When Christ was teaching the disciples how to pray, what did He say? Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just, just supply what we need today, Lord, and we'll be good. And what are we always worried about? Next week. <laughs> what are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do next week? You know? Give us this day our daily bread. You're exactly right. He gave them every day exactly what they needed. But what they do? They started complaining. And they said, Lord, this bread's all right, but a little meat show would be good. Now, I'm going to tell you, me and God get along real well, and I'll tell you why. He sent them quail. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love quail. <laughs> Man, me and my daddy used to go bird hunting, we come home with a mess of birds and clean them, and Grandma had fried them things with some grits and some homemade biscuits and some canes. Man, please. I would eat till I just about hurt myself. Oh, it was good. You know what? They kept complaining. They said, Lord, yeah, we know we got bread, but we want some meat, God. Now, were they surviving? Were they alive? Were they healthy? Yes. Just eating the manna. God gave everything they needed. But it wasn't enough. They had these cravings. And in verse 15, to me, is probably the saddest verse in the Bible. It says, And he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. I have that verse highlighted. You can see it. 
I got it highlighted right there. And you see I got a little line drawn and something handwritten in my Bible. You want me to read that to you right there? It says this, be careful what you ask for. You ever heard that before? Be careful what you ask for. You see, this chapter starts out with praise. They were praising him for his enduring mercy. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, since man ceases not to be sinful, since man ceases not to be sinful, it is a great blessing that Jehovah ceases not to be merciful. Oh, I like that. We're sinful. He's merciful. Aren't you glad? They, 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 they praised Him for His mercy. They praised Him for His mighty acts, all the miracles that He performed to get them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And all of that. But then they come back and said, but we sinned and so we're going to confess. They had a time of confession. They sinned just like the previous generation. See, the, 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 the fathers and mothers that wandered in the wilderness, they sinned, but this is a whole other generation. And they said, but we've sinned too. And they confessed. Now here's a sobering thought, and let me see if I can find it. Here you go. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. He starts that verse off by saying, Our fathers. This is a real sobering thought. Sometimes, often, uh, a father's sin is reflected in their children. Have you ever heard somebody say, he's just like your dad? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Either. It can be good, it can be bad. <laughs> it can be either one. You know, let me tell you something. You know, uh, uh, now my granddaddy, I loved him to death. He was 90 when he died. Uh, he was in his 60s when I was born. And, and I loved granddaddy. But by the time I came along, granddaddy had settled down a little bit. Uh, in fact, pretty good, but he was 65, 68, or something like that when I was born. But I've heard stories. I've heard my dad tell some stories. And let me tell you something. When people look at my father, they would tell him, he ain't nothing like your daddy. Ain't that a good thing? Because to be honest, my granddaddy, now he farmed, he worked hard, but he made liquor. And he drank a lot of it, and he was a mean drunk. And he was around. My daddy didn't want to be like his daddy. Do you, which father do you want to be like? I, I'm trying to be like my heavenly father. Yeah, that, that's what I want to be like. But it scares me even today, and my boys are grown and got their own family. But it scares me even today. Or are they like me? You know, do, do my sins show up in them? That, that bothers me. That thought just really bothers me. It, it ought to be a thought that parents think about before they are blessed with children and be working on. Uh, so they confessed, but they tested God. They didn't believe God could provide for them in the wilderness. And they had these cravings. They craved for more than they were getting. They wanted more. Does that sound familiar? Stop thinking about it. We live in a society that wants what? Everything. Everything. More, more, more. And when do they want it? Right, right now. Yes, they don't believe in working for something, do they? See, I, I was raised, and I, you know. We live in a giveaway of society. If you sit down and wait, somebody will Somebody will give it to you. That's right. Or either we got this society where, you know, you can pull your billfold out, and you got this little plastic card about that big. You can get it right now. Let me tell you something. <laughs> what, what, what youngins don't understand is you got to pay that. So at some point, you got to pay it. Okay. Now, I was always raised this way. If you want something, you work hard, you earn the money, and you go get it. And then you don't have to worry about it. 
sounds like a pretty good way of doing things to me, but no, nowadays we got to have this instant gratification. We got to have it right now. And hey, we can help you do it. Uh, I, what country music singer was it that sang that song called If the Devil Danced in Empty Pockets? Uh, he'd have a ball in mind, you know. And, and he's talking about all these places out here that try to sell you something right now. And then, you know, you can have it right now and it'll be all right. But you realize a couple months from now, oh, Lord, I got to pay them this money and I don't have it. How am I going to get it? What am I going to do? These people wanted more than they needed. They wanted more than God was providing for them. Let me ask a question. Do we need more and more and more? What did Jesus tell his disciples to pray? Give us this day our daily bread. Just, he said, look, just worry about today. The cares of tomorrow will take care of itself. You know, just worry about today. And it says he gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul. You know what? I had a guy tell me one time, just tell me what comes after but. You know, well, I would, but what comes after but? You know, let me ask you a question, though, going back. He gave them their request. <laughs> just because God answers one of your prayers, does that mean you're divinely favored? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that, does it? No. What does it depend on? It depends on what you ask for. I learned that a while back um, when I was at work when I first got married. I worked at PS at the bank. And I'm Alex. Um, I was getting over and going to school and so I wanted to get to Cordell and make more money. Well, I got that. But that was the worst two years of my working life. Yeah. <laughs> and um, anyway, that I didn't work at a bank. <laughs> yeah. But as I said, I've, I've learned how to, you know, and it kind of reminds me of when Kyle was here um, the other day and he was talking about, you know, these past couple months and with the COVID and everything changed. But um, God has blessed them every month, but it's in a different way, different form. And his, mm -hmm. I think his daughter in law, or daughter, yeah, said um, she just couldn't wait to the next month to see how God, what God was going to do. Right. And it's hard to do, but I, you know, if you let him do it, he do something that you he would. can't even imagine that, you know, trying to do or how to fix it or whatever. So, you know, sometimes God gives you what you ask for just to show you <laughs> how wrong you were in asking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes he does that as a learning for us. And that's what he did with Israel. He gave them their request. I mean, quail everywhere. You just walk out and pick them up. Mm. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? But it said that they gorged themselves on it, and a lot of them died. God was trying to get them to depend on Him and not to crave so much more. He gave them their request, but let me tell you something. It depends on what you're asking for, whether it means you're divinely favored or not. Because sometimes God will give you what you ask for to teach you a lesson. He should have just let them do without for a day or two, and then they'd be thankful for that bread. You're exactly right. Hey, Y'all remember who Jerry Fall was? I will never forget this. 1976, I heard that man speak in Martinsville, Virginia. And he told a story. He said he was there in Lynchburg, Virginia. And he said there was a man that I knew that lived in the community there in Lynchburg. And he said he was uh, being transferred. His job was being transferred. And uh, he was having to move and a lot of stuff he couldn't take with him. And he said, you know, he said, I always liked to hunt growing up. And he said, uh, this man came to me and said, Brother Jerry said, I, I'm moving. I, my company's moving me. I got to move. I can't take my dogs, and I got two fine bird dogs at the house. And Brother Jerry, I can't take them with me. If you want them, you can have them. All you got to do is come and get them. And he said, I thought about it, and I prayed about it, and I thought that'd be nice to have them two dogs, and that man's going to give them to me, and they hide all dogs. I mean, good trained dogs. 
And he said, so I told my wife, I'm going to buy a dog pen and I put it up and I got them two big old feed bowls and two big old water bowls and some dog houses and putting that big old pen out there in the backyard. And he said, I jumped in my pickup truck and I went to pick them up. And he said, I got there and the man, we loaded them up and he said, I put them in the dog box on the back of the truck. And the man before I left said, now brother Jerry, I, I forgot to tell you this now. I said, these are very high dollar dogs. They're high bred dogs. He said, uh, they won't eat anything but fresh meat. So on the way home, you might want to stop at the grocery store and get some fresh meat to give them. And Jerry said, I appreciate you telling me that. He said, on the way home, I stopped at the grocery store and I got two 50 pound bags of Purina dog chow. And he said, I went out there and I put the dogs in the pen and I filled them bowls up with plenty of that Purina dog chow. And you know what? That man was right. They didn't eat it. But three days later, they did. <laughs> God could have done that, couldn't he? <laughs> you know, and, and Falwell was telling it, even in 1976, we need Americans to go to work, okay? He said, look, he said, let them go hungry a few days, they'll go to work. And you know, I think about my grandmother Wilcox, who was half starved when she married my granddaddy. She was hungry the whole time she grew up. Nobody came to her house without eating, period. She couldn't stand the thought of anybody not having something to eat because she grew up hungry. And, and so when, when you went to grandma's house, you were going to eat. I used to, they had a side screen porch. And you walk in on a screen porch and there was a table over there. And it always had food on it with a tablecloth over it. And that first corner of that table you get to right there, you pull that tablecloth back, that's where the appetites were. Mm. Mm. I could eat the whole plate full. My grandma could make an apple tart. And, uh, let's put it this way. If you set one on top of your head, your tongue would beat your brains out. Trying to get to it. And whenever we drive up in the driveway, Grandma would go just pour me a glass of milk and have it waiting on me because she knew the first place I was going was right there at them apple tops. I don't know, I've never known what it is to be hungry. Never had. I've always had something. I have been really blessed by God. I can't imagine what my grandmother's life was like growing up. <clears throat> but it'll motivate you when you get hungry. It will motivate you to do something. What does leanness mean? It says he sent leanness to their soul. What does leanness mean? What do you think? What do you think about when you think about leanness? Lacking or starving or... Right, kind of just right. Most of the time we think of... Satisfaction. <laughs> Most of the time we think of like uh, physical emaciation or something. You know, you've seen pictures of people who are starving and are just skin and bone. That's what we think about a lot of times. And that is a true meaning of leanness, okay? But there's more. They, what about? they like spiritual blessings. That's right. The spiritual aspect of it is what they were missing out on. They were spiritually starving to death. I've read all kinds of commentaries on this in the past spiritual barrenness you know kind of like the wilderness that they were in spiritually just bare nothing there uh, no appetite for the word of God unsettled or uneasiness of mind let me ask you a question would you rather be hungry or mentally or in your soul troubled what would you rather be I'd rather be hungry. I'd rather everything be all right in my heart and my mind, in my soul. No peace. Right. No peace. That's, a, that's probably the best way to put spiritual leanness. No peace in your heart. Which is worse, physical illness or sp spiritual illness? Well, the Bible's very clear on that. Look, you know, why do all this stuff to save the body when the soul is going to be gone? When it, you know, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You know? 
Which is worse, spiritual. But this whole thing has to do, I think, with prayer. What was their prayer? Lord, give us more. And Jesus said, when you pray to his disciples, give us this day our daily bread. Just give us this day. You know what? I have tried to make myself over the past few years when I get up in the morning and I read and pray. I have tried to make myself just pray this prayer. Lord, just get me through today. I ain't going to worry about it tomorrow. Just get me through today. What did they ask for? They asked for more. They were craving more. And they got it. But the question is, what do we ask for? What do we ask for? They had everything they needed every day, but they wanted more. Their cravings got to them. Now stop and think about this. As individuals, I think Paul said it best in 1 Timothy when he said, Having food and raiment, raiment, let us be there with content. In other words, if we got a little something to eat gets through the day and we got clothes to put on our back, we ought to be content. And we really should, shouldn't we? But what about in the sense of a church? How about in the sense of a church? Revelation chapter 3, which I am working on, Ms. Aline, I promise you. I'm working on it. We're going to do Revelation. Hopefully pretty soon. Revelation chapter 3. Church at Laodicea. What did the church at Laodicea say? Do you remember? I know it gets kind of hard because there were seven of them. Church at Laodicea said we're rich. We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. but they were lean in spirit. Because you know what God said about them? Practically in the same verse, you know what God said about them? He said, you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. In the spiritual sense. Listen. It's nice for our church to have things. It's nice for our church to have resources that we can use for His glory. It's nice to have all that, but if we have lost our spiritual direction, it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. we got to keep the main thing the main thing, right? Do you all have comments, questions?